My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. It is awesome to have you with us. You are the brave ones. You made it. Those of you sitting at home, not so much. But thanks for tuning in anyways. And uh, hello to those of you in our parent viewing rooms. That is a great option if you have small children you prefer to keep with you during the service. And you've noticed on your chairs, there's a small group catalog. And so we've got a whole new season of small groups that are going to be rolling out here. So feel free to check that out. That same catalog can be found right on uh, your app, on the Church Center app, uh, on your dashboard. So feel free to check all that out. And then just a couple of uh, notes before we jump in. One, this Westbridge Connect we have coming up, it's uh, on a Friday night. And we really wanted to give this its own special night and go, man, if if you're just trying to figure out like what is like how we operate, the reason we do things, why we do things, the way that we do things, that maybe it's different from a church you've been a part of in the past, or you're just trying to learn more about like our core values and what really, you know, you get to peek beneath the engine a little bit, uh, that's the place to go. It's a Friday night. We're going to provide dinner. We're going to provide childcare, and we're just going to walk through who we are as a church, where we're going as a church, and I would really encourage you, if you haven't been through one of those, come and check that out uh, on uh, uh, January 26th. And then uh, right after service, uh, we do this every single week after every single service is five and five. And uh, that's just five things about Westbridge Church in five minutes or less. Both of those are great options to learn more about Westbridge. Now, uh, the other thing I want to say is this. Last week, we had a missionary here, a guy that we've been working with for the last few years. He's one of our global partners. Uh, Many of you have asked us like, hey, I missed it last week, and I've heard so many good things, and I wanted to go and watch it. And unfortunately, uh, due to just where he and his family work in Istanbul, uh, we were not able to keep it online. And the reason for that is just, uh, if you heard some of his stories, he talked about oftentimes their lives would be in danger. Oftentimes, uh, he's had uh, friends who have been killed or deported. And uh, so he's like, we can stream the service, but right after service, we got to take it down because if anyone were to catch it later on, uh, it could really put our family in danger. So for those of you that have asked, that's the reason that it's not up. uh, And um, I don't have any bootleg copies available, unfortunately. (laughs) So uh, however, I do want to say this. Uh, it's so cool to see someone that we've been partnering with for several years come and share their stories. And that's only possible because you've been such a generous church. And I just want to say thanks for your generosity. Uh, man, we support those guys in a massive way. We're one of their largest uh, supporters. And um, for them to be able to stay and do the work that they're doing is in large part because of the generosity of this church. And so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, every time around this year, we start thinking about the new year, right? It's, this is like New Year's resolutions, things we want to change. And uh, in the new year, it's like turning the page on the calendar gives us this new mental resolve. And whatever we didn't accomplish in 2023, we're like, this is the year. Now I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. It's a new year. It's filled with new hope. And this is definitely going to be the year. And that is a great feeling, right? For about two weeks. And then it sort of wears off, doesn't it? And then we realize the idea of a reset is much more appealing than the work of a reset. And uh, I think there are some fundamental foundational shifts that we can make that will help us make 2024 an incredible year. Uh, And actually kind of change our lives, if we could make some shifts in our lives. Uh, There's a book called The Power of Habit, and in this book, uh, the author, Charles Duhigg, talks about what he calls a keystone habit. A keystone habit is one specific habit that has a disproportionate effect on multiple areas of your life. So he says, if, if, if you can figure out what a keystone habit is, this one thing can actually have this domino effect and have a disproportionate effect into multiple different parts of your life. So for example, you might say, well, in 2024, I really want to be more consistent with working out. But if you back that up a little bit, a keystone habit might be, hey, if I start going to bed at 10 o'clock every single day, then that is, it will affect my ability to work out, it will affect my energy level through the day, it will affect multiple different areas of my life, because backing it up and thinking about that foundational shift actually has a disproportionate effect in a, in, a, in a really healthy way in multiple areas of my life. And so it's a great way to think about this. And in this series, that's what we want to do. We want to explore some of these holy shifts that will help us to become everything God has created us to be. So today I want to make us, I want to help us make this holy shift from, from me to we. That, that our thinking would shift from me and my life to we. That we, are, we don't exist in isolation. We exist in community. There's a story, and maybe you heard this, just over five years ago, Uh, This is a true story. Uh, There was an alert that got sent out to the people of Hawaii. 
And it was around 8 a.m., uh, and uh, people were just waking up and getting ready for the day. Some people were getting ready to hit the beach. Uh, some people were making breakfast. Some people were a little groggy and hungover from the night before. Uh, some people were taking a walk. Some people were just scrolling through their phones. And all of a sudden, uh, people are doing all kinds of different things, and suddenly there's this alert that gets sent to everyone's phones. And we actually, there's multiple screenshots of this. This is the screenshot of what came through to people's phones. It said this. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. That's it. And so people all over the island got this on their phones. And people are going crazy for the next 38 minutes. It was 38 minutes before the call came and said, hey, this was actually a mistake. Somebody accidentally sent this out. And so for 38 minutes, everyone who received that alert began to prepare themselves for their final minutes here on earth. I mean, can you imagine this? For 38 minutes, they were able to focus on what really mattered. For 38 minutes, everyone had absolute clarity on what was most important. For 38 minutes, everybody's life came into focus, crystal clear focus. And there were a few articles that came out uh, after this incident and talked about the different phone calls, the different text messages that got sent during that 38 minutes. And you can imagine, uh, before they found out the alert was an accident, that it wasn't a real threat, you can imagine what those texts said. Lots of I love yous. Lots of I forgive yous. Uh, a, a lot of people trying to make things right. Messages went out to uh, alienated family members just trying to make things right before the end of their life. Uh, lots of people sort of panicking and trying to control things through their text they had no control over. Lots of people repenting and praying. Just this unbelievable. For 38 minutes, everyone was forced to consider, what kind of an impact have I had with my life? How am I going to be remembered? What are the things that I wish I had said that I, I want to make sure I don't leave unsaid? And so people, for 38 minutes, thought about who is most important in my life? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to send a message to? Who do I need to call? Now, the, that 38 minutes felt like a curse because in many ways, it was a lot of unnecessary fear and stress. And yet, in other ways, those 38 minutes were a blessing. They got people to stop and think about what really mattered. And it's really difficult to focus on what really matters in your life when you're not in a 38-minute time crunch. But it's important for us to do, to stop and consider what matters the most. And I think it's really obvious, even if you don't have a 38-minute time crunch, it's obvious what matters most to us is people. It's community. It's relationships. It, people are what bring the most joy in our lives. And, and so how do we make this shift in 2024 to shift from thinking through the lens of me to thinking through the lens of we, that we exist not in isolation, that we exist not simply as myself, inter, you know, independent me, but I'm a part of something that's bigger than me, that we belong collectively to something. And so uh, part of the, the reason behind that is this big idea I want to share with you today. Westbridge Church must continue to grow larger and smaller at the same time. Larger and smaller at the same time. As a church, we absolutely must keep growing larger. And here's the reality. It's not because anybody set out to grow a large church. That's never been a part of our mission statement. You don't see it written down anywhere. Nowhere does it say our goal is to, you know, we don't ever set even uh, goals around numbers of people. That's never the goal. The goal is let's just share the good news of Jesus with as many people as possible. And when you do that in an area that's growing, then the church keeps growing. It, the, the need drives the function. Now, for instance, I used to have a sweet little Ford probe pretty sweet. Two-door, uh, it was all black, uh, had some shag carpet seat covers. Uh, and I would drive that thing around, but this is before we had kids. It had, the, it had the headlights that were like in the hood, and then they would like pop up. I felt like Knight Rider. I mean, it was awesome. And then guess what? Then we had a kid. And, and so we said, oh man, we need a little bit bigger vehicle. So we bought uh, like a, a little uh, sport utility vehicle, Mitsubishi Montero Sport. We had that, and then we had a second kid, and that worked fine. But by the time we had a third kid, guess what we needed? A minivan. Everyone's dream vehicle. <laughs> and I can tell you, it wasn't because I was like, man, I just can't wait till we can get a minivan. It's because uh, the need for capacity drove that decision. We never set out to create a large church. That was never the goal. We just know we want to make sure there's room for everyone who wants to join. We got to make sure there's room so that you can invite your friends, so that you can invite your neighbors, so that you can invite your loved ones. 
your friends, your coworkers. And as we point people to Jesus, people keep joining. That's good. And so we have to keep reaching out and we have to keep finding ways of helping people find and follow Jesus. That's what we're all about. And sometimes I hear people say this, not any of you, of course, but other people outside of this place will say something like, I just don't like large churches. I don't like large churches. And I just want you to know, the very first church, if you read this in the book of Acts, Luke records this for us, the very first church launched with 3,000 people in one day. So, you know, if you don't like large churches, you're not gonna like Westbridge. And that's not because we're setting out to build a big church, but we must keep growing larger. Also, if you don't like large churches, you're probably not gonna like heaven. I'm just saying, keep that in mind. But as a church grows larger, it can be easy to get lost in the crowd. And we recognize that, and that can't happen. And we don't want that to happen, and we can't let that happen. And so uh, we have to grow smaller as we grow larger. There's, there's strategic advantage to going, how do we help people get connected? And the reality is this, you don't have to know everybody, but you should know somebody. You don't have to know everybody here, but you should have some friends here that you're Velcro to, that you're connected to. And so we've got to grow larger and smaller. And as a result of that, we have two separate gatherings. So we've got this large group gathering here on Sundays. This is where we gather together, we worship together. When we sing these songs, it's an opportunity for us to go, you know what? I'm coming in with my problems and my issues and all of the things that are going on in my week. And you're coming in with your problems. And you know, none of you have issues, but I'm bringing mine. And then we get to sing together. And what we do is we take the focus off of me. I take the focus off of you. And all of a sudden, we, we, in a group, we shift our focus to the one who created everything. The backdrop becomes the vastness and the goodness and the grace of God. It does something to us. There's something powerful about that dynamic, and it's in this setting that we get to do that. And then we hear teaching from the scriptures that helps open our eyes, that helps us understand Jesus a little bit more clearly, helps us understand uh, what's going on in us and going on in others a little bit more clearly. It helps us to grow. It's designed to inspire us and challenge us to help us to become more like Jesus. And then we have smaller group gatherings that happen all over the area called small groups. These are groups of 12 to 20 people who gather together to talk about their lives, talk about, okay, how can I take what we talked about on a Sunday and what, what we're learning in the scriptures and actually apply it to my specific context so I can put that into practice. And honestly, this isn't even our idea. The church has always done this. Luke gives us an account of this in the book of Acts. And here's what he writes about the very first church. He says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. First of all, I want you to notice they're enjoying the favor of the people and God is blessing and adding to their number. It's pretty obvious. You don't have to dig too deep into this to realize God is blessing what is happening. And so what's going on here? Well, they're doing some simple things, but they're doing them consistently and regularly. They're meeting in the temple courts and they're meeting in homes. A couple of chapters later, Luke says this, uh, they met uh, in the temple courts and house to house. They met in the temple courts and they met house to house. And there's a pattern, there's a ritual in the life of the church. It's a good ritual, it's a good habit that says we, we gather in a large group gathering and then we meet house to house. And meeting in large groups and in smaller groups is not a new idea. Getting together in a larger group setting and then meeting together in smaller groups has always been a rhythm that the church has found as a way to help us continue to grow in our faith. And so temple courts is what we do here, Sunday morning services, right? And the purpose is to learn about and celebrate God's grace and extend it to others. We always want to do things in a way that it makes it easy for you to invite your friends. But then house to house is what we would call small groups. And the purpose is to grow spiritually and relationally in community that you make some friends who are moving in the same direction as you spiritually. And following Jesus only happens in the context of community. It's really difficult. In fact, I would even argue it's impossible to follow Jesus in isolation. In other religions, you know, the, the, the more spiritual you become, the more isolated you become. You become the, the guru that's you know, on the mountain meditating, or you, you, bec you become the monk that's far away from everyone. But the reality is this, when you follow Jesus, the more like Jesus you become, the more deeply entrenched in community you become. And so why should I make this holy shift in 2024 from me to we? 
Well, let me give you a few motivating factors, and then we're going to talk about what kind of community we're building here at Westbridge. First, you need to know this. Friendship and support are found in community. Friendship and support happen the best in community. All of us hit what we call need to know and need to grow moments. So here's what that is. A need to know moment is this, and we've talked about this before. A need to know moment is this. There's a piece of information that I need that I don't have. I got questions about this faith thing. So who do I ask those to? I've got something I need to know. Uh, It's just a need to know moment and I can keep moving forward in my faith, but I got this question that I'd like to have answered. And when you have questions and you need to understand something, when you're connected in community, you have people to go to to ask your questions. So all of us hit need to know moments. And then all of us hit what we call a need to grow moment. And a need to grow moment is this. I don't need new information. I know exactly what the Bible is teaching. I know exactly what God wants me to do. And I don't want to do it. And so you know what I need in that moment? I need some people who can encourage me. And the word encourage literally means to instill courage. I know the right thing to do, but I'm a little nervous. You know, it feels like a risk to me. But I need some people who can give me some of their courage and help me on the right path. Have you ever been walking along, kind of minding your own business? This happens all the time uh, when you're on a sidewalk and and all of a sudden you you trip on something. And what is the reaction we all have every single time? We all look back to see what we tripped on, right? Like 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 we're going to see a little leprechaun who's just like laughing at us and like, ha ha, I got you. We're shocked. We're stunned that we tripped over. And it's just a crack in the sidewalk or, you know, something sticking up on the deck or whatever. And the truth is, uh, there's going to be things that come up in our lives that we just didn't see coming things that we stumble over. Because if we could see them coming, we wouldn't have stumbled over them, right? And and as smart as you are, and as spiritual as you are, and as much as you know about the Bible, it is impossible to make it through life without coming across things that cause us to stumble, that cause us to get tripped up once in a while. In fact, Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived outside of Jesus, he he has some some incredibly practical uh, wisdom as it relates to this topic. He says this, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Now, Solomon isn't speaking specifically about falling down. He's talking about a metaphor for life. He's saying life is a journey that is not meant to be lived alone. He's creating this metaphor and saying when you stumble in life, if you're walking with someone, then there's hope for you. They can help you up and vice versa. But the person who stumbles, who has no one to help them up, is in real trouble. The person, the parent whose 16-year-old is going down a dangerous path, and they have no one to lean on, and they have no one to get wisdom from, and they have no one to encourage them, they're in real trouble. The person, the marriage that is suffering and has no one to help them, and no one to counsel them, and no one to guide them, is in real trouble. The person who's dealing with depression and anxiety and feels hopeless and has no one to help them is in real trouble. The person who is battling addiction with no one to help them is in real trouble. If you're going to experience friendship and support in your life, then we must make the shift from me to we. Because here's the reality. It's easier to stumble away from God than it is to stumble away from community. And the truth is, when you walk away from people of faith, oftentimes you end up walking away from faith. And some of the most difficult emails and phone calls that we get here at the church are from people who have stumbled in life. They've come across something that they didn't anticipate, and it's tripped them up, and they they need some help somewhere along the way, but they never, ever took the time to build community. And so we get random calls every once in a while, and they're just like, hey, I just really need your help, and we do our best to help them. But the reality is, in relationships is where you really find friendship and support because community is like retirement savings. If you wait too long to invest in it, it won't be there when you need it. And you can't retroactively microwave community. So I want to encourage you, somewhere along the way, you're going to need friendship and support. So start building community now. Here's another thing that happens in community. Number two, spiritual growth happens best in community. It happens the best when you have other people walking in the same direction as you. And here's what happens. Sometimes we separate ourselves from our spiritual family, from spiritual community. Uh, So many times over the years, we've had people who, for whatever reason, they just get busy and life gets in the way and they sort of just drift away from church. 
and they're not attending the larger group gatherings where we worship together corporately and, and, we, and we've you know, put our focus on the one who created us. Over time, they, they stop attending and, and stop going to their small group and recognizing the inspiration that comes from the teaching of the scriptures and, and just end up making some lifestyle choices, a lifestyle decision that goes against what they believe and, and what they come to a crossroads. All of a sudden, here, here's the thing, like, well, I profess to believe this, but I've kind of drifted from my family of faith, and now I've kind of made some decisions that go against what I profess to believe. And now that puts you at a crossroads where you say, I can either realign my life with my belief system to get those things back in sync, or I can change what I believe to match the way that I'm behaving. And unfortunately, if you're not connected to a faith community that's helping to guide you and instruct you and, and encourage you and walk alongside you, it's so much easier rather than to say, you know what, I need to start shifting my behavior to get more in line with what I profess I believe. It's much easier to just shift my beliefs to now line up with my current behavior. And, and unfortunately, we lose out on what God wants to do in us and what God wants to do through us when we do that. Now, again, in these verses, Solomon continues in the next set of verses, he says this, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. Two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one person be warm alone? A, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Again, Paul, uh, or, uh, Solomon is using just things that we would understand from everyday life, especially those that are uh, in his era in human history. He says, if you're on a long journey and, and, and you're out at night alone and it, the night gets cold, how do you keep warm? But man, he's like two people, two people can spoon. They can cuddle. There's, there's warmth there. He says, if you're by yourself, you're on a long journey, you could be attacked and defeated. But if you got two of you, you can stand back to back. You can defend each other. Don't miss this. If you want to grow spiritually and you want to grow in your faith, you cannot do it alone because following Jesus is not simply learning a bunch of theology. Following Jesus is about moving toward a certain way of living and a certain way of loving. And you don't do that without other people who are moving in the same direction as you. So your, your friendship and support happen best in community. And growing spiritually happens best in community. And finally, um, this is so important. God's purposes are accomplished in community. Just think about the support that we've been able to give global partners like Dustin and his family who were here last week. The reason we're able to support them at such a level that we do is not because of any one individual, but because of the collective efforts of this group of people called Westbridge Church. It's amazing the impact. Uh, when, you, when you look around what happens here on a regular weekend, it's amazing to see how many individuals it takes just to hold services. I mean, as you drove in today, you saw signs that were directing you. You saw people that were waving at you in the parking lot. And actually, you thought they were waving, but today, his, their hands were just frozen solid. They couldn't move. You saw, like, ice dripping off their beards, right? Uh, this church doesn't exist without those people. We've done surveys of our guests and said, hey, what did you like the most? And uh, I would often read these surveys and eagerly await for them to come back. And people say things like, man, the teaching was so inspiring. The talk changed my life. Uh, man, so much eye candy from the pastor. <laughs> and yet consistently, do you know what the surveys would say? They'd say things like this. I, I was amazed that people would wave as we drove in. So many people said hello to me when I walked through the doors. See, this is not built around one person. This is a collective effort. Westbridge Church is not and will never be a one-man show. Westbridge Church doesn't exist without the countless volunteers who show up and make coffee and greet guests and teach kids and pass out programs and play music and write my talks for me. <laughs> I, I love the way that the Apostle Paul describes this in Romans. He says this, just as our bodies have many parts, so it is with Christ's body. We are the body of Christ, and there's many different parts that make up one collective whole. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. And in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And when each of us takes what God has given to us, the gift he's given to us, and then we deploy that and we use it 
in the body of Christ, then the body of Christ functions the way that it's intended to function. Many different parts, each part doing their specific function, one complete unit, operating in unity. And it is only in community that God's purposes in the world are accomplished because it's way too big for any one individual or any one person. And it's never meant to be built on any one person or the personality of any one person. It is every single person saying, here's what God has done for me, and I'm going to find my role, and I'm going to participate. And so you've got friendship, support, spiritual growth. All of this happens in community, and God's purposes are ultimately accomplished in community. Now, what kind of a community are we building here? Because every church has its own flavor, not right or wrong, but we want to go, okay, at Westbridge Church, what is it that we're specifically building? What does that community look like for us? I want to walk through that in just the next few minutes. First of all, I want you to know this. We are committed to imperfect people. See, community and being in community with other people isn't always easy because all of us are imperfect. All of us have some issues. And we, we were built for community. We long for community. But people really do have a misunderstanding about what the sort of biblical church is supposed to be about. And so for a lot of people, it's this place where either the perfect people or the wannabe perfect people kind of show up. And, and that's why so many people in our generation have said, man, I don't want any part of that hypocrisy. And I surely can't sort of measure up to the insane standards that people want to lay on me at the churches I've been at. And that's why from the very beginning of Westbridge, we've said this. Even when we were like launched in the theater, right? We said, you know, come as you are, no perfect people allowed, no making out in the back row. And those were good rules to live by. And we're here to dispense hope to our community. So it's always going to be messy because we're all screwed up people. I'm screwed up. You're screwed up. I've got issues. Most of you have issues, right? This is just the reality. Just look down your row, Right? Those people ain't putting the saint in St. Michael, I'm just telling you. (laughs) And here's what's amazing. The Apostle Paul would say this because he recognizes in community, it's messy. It's always going to be messy because we're all imperfect people. And so here's the sort of guidelines that the Apostle Paul would give those in community. He says, always be humble and gentle. When we're dealing with each other, we need to be humble and gentle. He says, be patient with each other. Because when me as an imperfect person is dealing with you as an imperfect person and two imperfect people are in community with each other, it tends to get messy. And so we've got to be patient with each other. We make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Love says, yeah, you've got issues and I've got issues, but we're going to make space for that because we exist in community. And the one thing that we have in common is Jesus. And he's the one who gives grace to you and he gives grace to me. So whatever we were before, Because we're both followers of Jesus, we're now moving in the same direction. So we're going to give each other space, make allowance for our faults. He says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Make every effort, make every effort. He says, give give allowance for your faults and make every effort to keep peace. The, The unity that you experience comes from God's spirit. And so living and loving community means we give each other the benefit of the doubt. And sometimes I hear this, well, there's some things here at Westbridge that I just don't like. Well, get in line. (laughs) My list is longer than yours. Trust me, it's worse than you think. The truth is this. We're a church that's filled with imperfect people. This is not and never will be the perfect church. And if you're looking for the perfect church, you're going to have to look for it somewhere else. And when you find it, don't join it because you will screw it up. (laughs) I'm screwed up. I'm flawed, all right? I know you probably find this hard to believe, but at some point, I'm going to say something that will offend you. And if I haven't said something that's offensive yet, you're probably not listening very well. (laughs) Because here's the reality. This community called the church was never meant to be a hotel for saints. It is a hospital for sinners. That's what the church is called to be. It was never meant to house the most holy, those who are closest to God. It's meant to draw those of us who are furthest from God, those of us who need his grace. And that is all of us. So whatever your past, God wants to redeem your past. God wants to make you a part of his family. That's the message of the scriptures, that God is building a family and he wants you in it. And so you just got to know, like, this is always going to be messy because we're committed to imperfect people. And so you got to embrace the messiness of community. 
There's gonna be times where you're gonna join a group and somebody's gonna say something abrasive and someone's gonna say something offensive and at some point you're just gonna have to make allowance for each other's faults because of our love and stay united and work for peace because of God's spirit. So we're committed, committed, committed to imperfect people. Secondly, you gotta know this. We're committed to authentic community. Not just imperfect people, but we're bringing our imperfect, authentic selves to each other. And too often, what happens in churches is we pretend to be more spiritual because it's a church. Well, that's, we're at church, so we, we think that's what's required in church, and so we shift into superficial, safe, religious small talk. I heard a story recently about uh, a, a mom, and she had a, a little boy at the house, and a priest came to visit her, just came to check in, and and the mom was there, and as she's visiting with the priest, the, her son runs in, and he's got a dead rat in his hands. And he starts telling the story. He's like, Mom, Mom, I, I saw this rat behind the shed, and I threw a rock at it, and I hit it in the head. And the mom's just like, she's trying to be like, the, the priest is here. He goes, and then it didn't die, so I got another rock, and I hit it in the head again. And, and then it was kind of somewhat conscious, so I grabbed it by the tail, and I swung it against the shed. And then it was still kind of wiggling, so I swung it again. And the mom's eyes are just getting wider and wider. She's like, come on. She's like, ur, 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 you know? And he's like, and then I finally smacked it, and then it was dead. And then he looks over, and he sees the priest, and he goes, and then the Lord called him home. <laughs> and sometimes... That's the mindset that we have when it's like church. It's like, well, I'm going to be my real authentic self in every other place. But when I get to church, oh, I better, I better button up, right? I better be more spiritual. I, I better say the right thing. I better look the part. I better put on the facade. And unfortunately, for many, the church has become an unsafe place to be real, an unsafe place to fail, an unsafe place to bring my authentic self. And we feel like I got to put on this, you know, facade, and when that happens, I can tell you, the church becomes filled with hypocrites. That's what happens. If we don't keep the shame level low, the church becomes filled with hypocrites, everyone trying their best to maintain some kind of Christian facade on the outside, all the while struggling daily on the inside. Can I tell you something? I don't want to lead a church like that. Trust me, you don't want to be a part of one. I'm telling you, I don't want to waste my life in some fake community. Uh, where, you know, come in once a week, put on a happy, happy church face and just completely detach from the rest of my life where it's not safe enough to deal with what's really going on, fake some spiritual high that I'm not really having, a place where it's not safe to bring my doubts and my questions and my baggage and my struggles. Frankly, I see that as a waste of my life. And I don't believe God calls us to that because there is not one person in this room who hasn't been dragged through the mud and affected by the messiness of life. That's why we have to own it. And it's one thing to sort of like mentally buy into this notion that community is messy and, you know, uh, let's just be transparent. And it's another thing to walk into a community and actually be messy and vulnerable and transparent. That's why James, the brother of Jesus, at one point he's writing to followers of Jesus in the first century. And he says this, it's very practical wisdom. Make this your common practice. Not like this isn't the exception. This should just be the norm for followers of Jesus. This should be the norm. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. The common practice should just be, oh yeah, by the way, here's the issue. Here's what I'm struggling with. Here's where I'm a mess. Here's where I need help. James says this should just be a common practice for followers of Jesus, that we don't hide the messiness. The common practice should be that we confess to one another. And in that confession, we find hope and healing. But if we create an environment if we don't create an environment where it's okay to not be okay, where it's okay to fail, if we don't create an environment where it's okay to be transparent, where we continually keep the shame level low, then we're feeding the idea that you have to be perfect. And the minute you're not, you'll disappear. And so you need to know, we're committed to the mess. We are committed to imperfect people. We're committed to authentic community where we bring our whole imperfect self to each other. And third, we are committed to intentional community. We're going to do this on purpose. We're not going to stumble into this. Let's go back to that first set of verses that describes the early church that Luke writes about. And listen to what Luke describes as he talks about the first church and how they responded to the good news of Jesus. 
Here's what he writes. He says, they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals and to prayer. Now you can see this entire section of verses is about their devotion to certain practices because they are committed to being involved in all of these activities together. But here's the key. It doesn't happen by accident. And can I tell you something? Nothing happens by accident in our culture either. Nobody drifts into community. It just doesn't happen. This is one of the most incredible and truly countercultural aspects of this group of followers. It says this, and as he continues, he says that uh, they worshiped together at the temple courts each day. Each day. It doesn't say they met when they felt like it. It says, no, no, they were devoted. They were committed. They, They were intentional. They made it a priority. Do you think everyone felt like that all the time? No. Uh, imagine if, when, when Cherry and I had three small children, uh, five and under, at that season of our lives, imagine if she said to me, hey, what time are you coming home from work? And my response was this, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm not really feeling it today. You know, I don't know if I'm in the mood. I've kind of had a hard day. And those kids of ours, sometimes they spill stuff and uh, they make a mess. And, and honestly, I find them a little draining. So... <laughs> I don't know, I'll probably just, well, I'll probably just uh, hang out a little later tonight. Um, I'll let you know. How well do you think that would go over? How long do you think we'd be married? That would not work. Life together is a commitment that you make. In the body of Christ, it's not optional. It's a commitment that you make. Because I'm following Jesus, I'm committed to the people of Jesus. In fact, this is so fascinating. One of the metaphors that's used in the New Testament for the church is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. Uh, That means that there's this relationship that Jesus has with the church. So oftentimes when I hear people say like, oh, you know, I'm following Jesus, but I'm doing it on my own, right? I don't need the church. I don't need organized religion. It's like, "Eh, I had a bad experience with that once. It's like, Jesus, I mean, you're really cool, but I really can't stand your wife. And the truth is, we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And it's imperfect. And it's messy. And the only way that it works, the only way that it moves forward is if we are committed to it. We say, you know what? I'm going to make a commitment to this. And we're going to have some good seasons and we're going to have some rough seasons. But I'm just, I'm going to be intentional about showing up. See, they devoted themselves to this community. And people have devoted themselves to the community of Jesus across the centuries and in all kinds of contexts. And it wasn't because somebody in charge kept begging them, not because God said, you better or else you're going to be in trouble. It's because they knew they were a part of a movement that was both changing their lives and changing the world and that the more they devoted themselves to it, the more they received from it. We are like little pieces of charcoal. We can sustain like the fire of God when we're in contact with each other. But when we get isolated, the fire goes out. And for some reason, it's like we can hold more of God when we're all together than when we get isolated and scatter from each other. One of the most commonly used phrases in all of the scriptures is one another. And you cannot fulfill all of the one another's without another. In fact, this is what the writer of Hebrews says. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. Instill courage in each other, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In other words, don't stop gathering with the people that you're in community with. Be committed to it. Be devoted to it. Be intentional to motivate one another. And and the author says some people have stopped gathering, and the problem is... The friendships and genuine spiritual community never happen by accident. You will never drift into community. You've got to make it a priority. Now, here, here's some of the pushback. But I had a bad experience. I, you know, I joined a group and it was just such a bad experience. Listen, you've had a bad pizza. It didn't stop you from eating pizza. You've had a bad haircut. It didn't stop you from going back and getting your haircut. And the truth is, you didn't stop those things. Keep going. Try it again. Try a different group. Jump into another group. You will find the people that you connect with. Secondly, uh, I've heard this. 
well, there just isn't a group for me. You know, I look through your group's catalog, there isn't a group for me. Sounds like you need to start one. See, all of our group leaders, I, I know, the collective gasp that's about to arise in this room, <laughs> they're imperfect people. <laughs> all of them, all of our group leaders, they're messy, they make mistakes, they say offensive things, they've got issues. But they're saying, look, I'm just going to create a space for some other imperfect people. So if you're looking through the catalog and you're like, man, there's just not a group for me, maybe it's time for you to start a group. And and we would love that and we would welcome that for you to say, I want to start a group with other people so that I can connect in community. And it's very possible the group that you start might be the thing that God uses to help somebody else find and follow Jesus. So we can do this. See, your time and attention will always try to steal you away from community, and it will always be hard work. This is why it's so important for us to be intentional. And let's just be honest. We are intentional about the things we want to be intentional about. And here's what we know. We are better together. So let's commit to doing together better. Let's commit to that. And here's what's amazing about this. Jesus invited you into his family. The whole point of the scriptures is all about imperfect, messy people and a perfect God and how he invites us into, our, into his family. So much so that Jesus came into this world to reveal exactly who he is. He showed us God's love in the most incredible display of love. He allowed himself to be put to death. His body was laid in a tomb. And according to multiple eyewitness accounts, Jesus overcame death, which means death is not the end. There is more to this life than this life. And you've been invited to be a part of God's family. And if you've never said yes to that, you don't earn your way in, you don't have to behave your way in, it's just an invitation that's been extended to you. And if you've never said yes, you can say yes by just agreeing with this prayer as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times that I've walked away from you. And I'm so grateful that you never walk away from me. So I wanna say yes to your invitation. Make me your son, make me your daughter and help me to put my trust in you, to follow you as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, I pray for every single one of us that are doing our best to follow you, may we recognize we can't do it in isolation. May we make this shift from me to we, from isolation to community. And may we be intentional about it so that we can instill courage in one another to experience the fullness of your love and your grace in our lives. May our lives point others to you. We pray this in your name. Amen.